Hey there cats and kitties, I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, and with this video I'll be briefly discussing my thoughts on episode 1 of the anime series Alice to Zoroku, uh, and this was really something that defied my expectations. The first episode is twice the length as a normal anime episode, it's like 44 minutes, something like that, uh, give or take some change, and um, it actually went completely <laughs> in a different direction than I had first assumed looking at the PV. I thought it was meant to be sort of a, a comical series, and it is not without its comical moments, to be sure, but um, it was actually something sci-fi, fantasy, mystical, girls with superpowers. Like, I was kind of reminded of uh, uh, Madoka Magica a little bit with the character designs of some of these girls and everything, and it just astounded me. I, I started watching it, and I saw the length as soon as I start the episode. I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> you know, I don't know what what to really make of this. I thought this was a comedy series, and this is how long the first episode is, and the, you know, sort of the pilot, I guess you could say. And and it just the next thing I knew, the end credits were rolling. I was transfixed by this. the The two main characters, uh, you know, Sana and, and Kashimoto, respectively. I love how they bound off each other. I love that this guy is very grandfatherly. And and when confronted with this little girl, it, it's kind of like it doesn't really matter to him. While he's mystified, he's mind blown about the powers she's wielding. You know, like he he's still he it doesn't really he doesn't give any care or concern to that effect. Like he's he's kind of spooked by it, but at the same time, this is a little girl, and you're gonna listen to your elders. You're gonna learn the way to behave in public. You're gonna learn not to use that magic willy nilly. People's lives could be at risk. All this stuff, I absolutely love this dynamic from the beginning. And and it's really intriguing because we see that Sana is is kind of trying to escape this research facility. There's like a, a big medical conglomerate or something like that where they're conducting this research through her dialogue, revealing to Kashimoto later. We, we come to understand there are a whole host of of children primarily all we see is girls i believe um there's the one character whose gender is kind of a question mark for me but i think it's primarily all girls and they all wield this special ability and uh, i love all the allusions to alice in wonderland there's a, a sort of magnificent world that these girls i think sana even specifically has created within like one of the basements of this research facility something along those lines and and it's called wonderland and all this stuff and uh you know it's interesting that in a sense she's a blonde girl you know she has the frilly dress and everything kind of calling back to the victorian era where the original alice in wonderland was kind of set or at least uh, mentally the imagery you come up with you concoct when when you encounter the title, you know, Alice in Wonderland, that's kind of what you, you think of. And uh, so in a sense, even though her name is Sana, she she is kind of Alice incarnate through the looking glass. But <laughs> instead, it's flipped on its ear. It's Kashimura who has been brought through the looking glass, because as soon as he encounters this girl, you know, like like he's going and dropping off flowers. He is a florist by by trade. And apparently he's one of the best of the best of the best. Uh, you know, he's got some Yakuza guys who have ordered a, a special order for a marriage proposal. We see later in the episode he's actually going, and some of his guys are like, why is he bringing flowers? <laughs> you know, what's he expecting? Um, it's like, oh, the boss wants to get married. You know, he's going to ask that big penultimate question. And he wanted the most special arrangement of flowers that he could, that you know, he could get. He could attain, money could buy. And so he goes to this Kashimura, and at the start of the episode, that's how we're introduced to Kashimura. He is delivering this. They try to pay him a little extra, and he's like, uh-uh, no bribes, no cushiony money, and everything like that. They think he's out of his mind. I'm kind of like, <laughs> maybe a little bit. Um, I, I, would, I wouldn't mind taking the extra money. But of course, knowing where it's coming from, this guy is an honorable, respectable old man. He's seen some things. You, you get that from his, you know, the the performance of the character, the the actions of the character, and the way he carries himself. And this is impressive to me. He's a bit old school, but he, he's going to take his fee and his fee alone. He doesn't take the extra money. He doesn't want to owe anything to these guys, you know, because of the the ill color, the ill background of their natures being, you know, a, a mob syndicate and everything. And so, of course, he's leaving. He stops into like a convenience store. And the clerk there, who is familiar with him but hasn't seen him in a while, he's just there to get some cigarettes or whatever, and she brings to his attention, hey, there's this, like, creepy little girl. She's been staring at the food for, like, three hours. Can you can you help me do something? And he's like, why don't you call the police? You know, she seems like she's alone, she's lost, whatever it is. 
She's like, I called the police. They don't want to come. They don't want to do anything. They, they figure it's a waste of time. Well, why don't you tell the manager? Uh, the manager is the kind of guy who's stealing the, the donation money off the counter. He He's a bad man. You know, F him. I'm not calling him. I'm not getting him involved. We'll never see this kid again. And then she'll she'll end up a, a corpse somewhere. Uh, you know, so it's like... Kashimoto, he goes over, he confronts this girl, and she's all demanding. She's used to, I think, to to certain means, you know, getting her own way. If she's been incarcerated, if she's been held, if she's been captive, and they've been studying her and researching her abilities and putting her through, you know, all these different trials and tribulations, uh, you know, of course she wants anything but to to be involved with anything like that. But because of the power she wields, she is very domineering and commanding. She's like, I want to make a deal with you. You know, I will grant you any wish you can conceive of for help. And, and she doesn't specify what that help is. And of course, Kachimoto, like anyone would be, is like, huh? <laughs> you know, what are you talking about, kid? You don't talk to me that way. You know, you don't talk to your elders. You'd be more respectful. And her power is teleporting. She warps out of there. Now, this comes after a crazy you know, fight going back and forth between Sana and these other two power-wielding girls. I assume one of them is a girl. That's where the genderless sort of the, the question mark character comes into play. There's this character, a young boy or girl, wearing sort of a kimono, and he or she is floating around on these giant hands from out of the sky, and it kind of reminded me of Fully Cooley a little bit for some reason. And like, again, Madoka Magica. And she is trying to recapture, sent by this research facility to, to get Sana and bring her back. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this other power, power wielding young girl, I assume they're all, you know, children and, and, you know, teenage girls, comes out of nowhere and is using all these, like, you know, special power moves to fight off the one with the giant hands, floating around on the giant hands, trying to grab things and grapple things. And all hell is breaking loose. And, and this new girl is telling Sana, you know, eat this food, get up your calcium or whatever it is that powers their abilities. It, it drains after a certain time and they have to be fed a certain kind of food to refill it and everything like that. And it's almost like baby food that, that you know, Sana is, it has thrown before her, thrust before her. She downs it all and she ends up being able to warp out of there. But this other girl, this new girl who saved her life effectively and, and let her escape says something along the lines of, uh, you know, warp to, think of, focus on the biggest city you can think of, warp there, and then start wreaking havoc, you know? And, and so it's like, is this a good character? Is it a bad character? Is it a rebellious character who broke free? Is it another, you know, power-wielding girl from somewhere in the world? Sana describes this as being, you might say it's a kind of supernatural power. I don't exactly know if these girls are born with it, if they found some sort of mechanism, device, special crystal, you know, magical uh, implement that brings this about in them, whether it's kind of like the mutants and X-Men that they're born with it. They all seem to summon these glowing little like crown-like crystals and... and uh, as their power depletes, it depletes it, uh, of color and it, you know, sort of crackles and shatters away once it's all drained. Now, in the case of the two girls from the research facility, their crystalline entities, whatever you want to call it, the, these things that they summon forth to enhance and use their powers and abilities, they are pink. Whereas, if I remember correctly, because it was yesterday that I actually, <laughs> last night that I watched the episode, I think the new girl who comes in and saves Sana, hers was blue. So... I'm wondering if this denotes being from different places in the world. Maybe it's the pink ones that are, are directly associated with the research facility manipulating them and studying them and doing things to try to tweak them and quirk them and everything. Don't really know. But that's why I'm really engaged and highly curious to figure that out. Now, of course, you know, Kashimoto, he, he doesn't really know <laughs> what he wants to do with this little girl. For for a time, he's like, you know, all right, well, whatever. Um, you know, after meeting her in the convenience store and she disappears, he's like, whatever. I'm just going to go about my business, go about my life. He calls into work. He's like, uh, you know, his younger employees. I don't know if it's going to end up being his family or just people that actually he pays to work for him at the florist shop or, or, you know, getting the rest of the day's business done while he's running late. And he goes into his car and, and it's almost like this little Mr. Bean car, one of those European ones. And here is Sana in the back seat. He's like, how'd you get in my car? And she's like, don't worry about that. I I, I want to grant you a wish. Can we make this deal? 
know, like all of a sudden out of nowhere, this giant effing wrecking ball comes out of, it comes out of left field and it is going to destroy the car. Turns out to be two more, a, a couple of twins, these sisters, power wielding young girls. And they have been given the mission statement by this research facility and, and the doctors and security force uh, aligned to them to get Sana and bring her back no holds barred uh, in any way possible. We find that one of them can summon large chains and, and and put arrows or any other kind of thing on it. You know, in this case, a wrecking ball. The other one can actually fire arrows and it's just absolutely trippy. A chase ensues with somewhat wonky CGI effects of the city and the city streets and everything as, you know, Kashimura's car is, is trying to get speedily the hell out of Dodge. And all these things, the, these two twin sisters are chasing them. And finally, the car comes to a crashing halt and Kashimura gets out. And this is so effing hilarious. This is why I love this guy. And I, I'm so intrigued by the dynamic going on here. He's got three children. He already gave Sana a hard time for, for being a little bitch, effectively, being all domineering and commanding as, as sort of a, you know, bratty little child. He does the same thing to these three, all three of them together. He's like cracking them on the head. He's like, you do not behave this way. Do you see how endangered the city was? Women and children walk across these streets. Any one of them could have been hit by all of your weapons and everything. You're doing things, you know, willy nilly without a care or concern in the world. Look at your surroundings. Be proper. Behave properly. Show respect. Learn from you know your mistakes. I'm dying. I'm like, oh my god. He's got these power wielding young girls who are trying to kill him with all manner of supernatural you know devices and things like that. And he's like, like a typical father or grandfather. He's like, uh uh, you you children aren't going to behave that way. He doesn't care. They could manifest a spike through his effing skull right there and he's like uh i'm gonna teach these girls the right way the whole band of them gets arrested and they all end up having to be, be let go in the case of sana she teleports out of there that's her chief power and, and you know like in in the midst of questioning she's telling them uh what the two twins names are they're reluctant to answer any questions and everything like that then she teleports out of there and they all have to be effectively let go the, the two children are picked up again by people who represent the uh research facility sana as i say teleports out and and the one like chief detective he he's looking at the camera footage of sana just disappearing from one second to a ne to the next and he's mind boggled and basically from the higher ups he's told no more questions about this we you know the higher ups have said close this it's done all of the city streets all of the damage that was wrought in that heinous chase going on between these twins with power and and kashimura and sana it's all been undone. Everything has been repaired. There is actually no sign, not even down to skid marks on the streets, of any of it ever having happened. His car is completely and utterly repaired, where it was like, you know, one of the tires got blown out. There was a spike put through the back of it and all this stuff. The windows crackled and everything. It's perfectly brand new. And I'm just, I'm mind blown. I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> You know, the, the detective guy's like, we, we just came out and found it this way. Where Kashimoto's like, wow, you really you really got on the repair job here. Thanks very much. <laughs> you know, he's like, no, we found it this way. And uh, by the way, no more questions. You, you, maybe for your benefit, you don't want to ask any more questions about this. So, of course, Kashimoto decides to get rid of his car, which leaves me miffed because I, I lost... I, I've been through two cars in my life that I've owned, and one of them, cra the first one crapped out. I, I was bequeathed my second car from my grandfather who passed away. That eventually crapped out. I just could not afford the repairs. I can't afford a new car, so I've been without a car. I'm like, this mother effer goes, and because he's spooked, air quotes, spooked by his car and everything that happened, he just sells it and walks home. I, like, what? <laughs> You know, like, give me the car. It's a Mr. Bean car. I, I can barely fit in. I'll take it anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> but, you know, he goes to stop off for dinner. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of his ordering, he's like getting beer and, and this and that and the other thing. And all of a sudden, here's Sana again, out of the blue. I don't know how she found him. If she can sense where he is. She managed to, like, read his brain when they had their encounter in the convenience store. She knows all about him. She knows what kind of man he is, that he's honorable. He's not going to in any way harm her he doesn't pose a danger or threat to her and all this kind of stuff and like th this is 
miraculous to me, he ends up feeling for this young girl. He understands that she's lost. By seeing everything that he's seen, he can believe and take at face value what she says about the way her life has been led, being held captive, being studied and researched. And he understands that her notion of, I, I want to take down this research facility for what they're doing to children like me, what they did to me, what they did to other children like me. I don't know, again, if they're all, you know, little girls or whatever, or if there are boys in the mix as well. And he, he's kind of taken aback by that. And there's this really cute moment where he's like, have you eaten? I saw you looking at food in the convenience store. And then he's like, you know, order, order what you want. And she ends up ordering like piles and piles of food and just going through it. And everyone in the restaurant is like, is this like an eating contest <laughs> that this kid's training for? <laughs> What's going on? And so it's just so sweet. It, it, by the end of it, you know, they take like a taxi ride home and he's again being that very sort of fatherly, grandfatherly, mentorish kind of role that is so befitting of him telling her, you know, you don't use your powers. You don't wield them willy nilly. I'll, uh, he, at one point he even takes her to like a shrine to make the point that, you know, look at all these innocent bystanders that could have been killed, could have been harmed, maimed with your not really thinking about what you were doing. You were summoning forth these powers. These other girls were summoning forth these powers. All of these people could have fallen victim to whatever you were doing because you were doing it by instinct. Granted, she was fending for her life and trying to get away from these very, you know, lethal other other girls who were trying to recapture her. But I love that he's trying to implant those lessons into her. And finally, when, when they're very near to home, they stop off at his, you know, flower shop and she is wowed by the miraculous beauty of those flowers and everything. And I just love the discussion where he's like, you know what? Okay. Begrudgingly or reluctantly, though it may have been, I'm going to help this little girl. I'm going to help you. But here's the deal. We're not going to do this on a, you know, you'll grant my wishes. I don't want anything much as he did with the Yakuza earlier in the episode. He's not going to take extra money. He's not going to take anything that he isn't owed or anything like that. You know, that's the kind of honorable character he is. I don't want any of that fluff. I don't want any, you know, wishes granted, anything like that. Now, I do suppose there there might come a time where he ends up needing to call back on that, you know, maybe. But for the time being, he's not going to. And rather does he say, I just want you to be better of yourself, you know, you know, to conduct yourself better, to learn a better way to behave yourself and, and be respectful and think before taking action. You know, don't be so impetuous. Don't ever again use these powers as long as we're together. You know, I'm going to I'm going to put you to work. You're you're going to earn my help in that way. And, and you're going to you're going to conduct yourself like a respectable human being rather than a bratty little child, an instinctual, impetuous little child. And this is kind of where we leave it with, of course, calling back to the research people and saying, you know, we know where she is. We have an idea. Find her. Get her. Any means possible. Completely dumbstruck was I that this was the entirety of the story for this first episode for the series of what I thought was going to be an odd couple-esque comedy series, a cutesy kawaii comedy series. This is like gangbusters. Now, I will say, as I have said before, being that this is very much a first impressions video, I will not and cannot guarantee episodic coverage of this particular series, but I just had to put it out there. I was so blown away and intrigued by this first episode. It was nothing like I thought it was going to be, and in all the best possible ways. Like, if you haven't watched this, do so. Because, holy crap. It just blew me away. I, I It completely went beyond any sort of expectations or preconceptions I, I might have had. And again, in all the best possible ways. I was astounded by this. And uh, I'm definitely intrigued. I'm definitely committed to watching it in the very least, whether I, I you know, do uh, review coverage or not. Because um, i got to see where this is going to go. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm definitely highly, highly curious. And uh, so, yeah. Otherwise, that'll be pretty much it for me on this. Let me know in the comments below if you've seen this first episode, what your impressions of it were, if you were as impressed with it as I was. If not, why not? Let me know in the comments. Anything goes, as long as we have just a great discussion and, and such like that. And, uh, yeah. Otherwise, uh, I will catch you all later. <laughs> Peace.